My presentation will discuss the innovation of the potter's wheel in prehistoric Aegea. It will focus on the actions of potters operating in the Greek mainland during the 3rd and early 2nd millennium, that is the last phases of early bronze and the beginning of middle bronze age. I will start now my presentation by going forwards in time in the late 2nd millennium, that means roughly 1,000 of years after the appearance of the earliest gourmet potter in the Greek mainland. During the late Bronze Age, the communities in this part of the Aegean would experience a major socio-economic transformation with the emergence of what we call Mycenaean palatial system. It is the time when we can recognize a real breakthrough in the history of local potting technologies with the extended adoption of the potter's wheel and the subsequent decline of hand building techniques. The strong visibility of gourmet pottery during this period led to the assumption that the potter's wheel was a technological innovation whose adoption was motivated by functional and economic factors. It has been a common view in archaeology that only a centralized and hierarchical society, such as the so-called Mycenaean, could afford a know-how of high technical specialization like that of the potter's wheel. The dominant interpretation linked thus the innovation of the wheel with the salarian phenomena of craft specialization developed in the context of palatial organization and with the power strategies of the elites. This approach to the wheel phenomenon echoed the standard instrumentalist understanding of technology, which sees the technical process as a disembodied and culturally neutral craft activity. According to this view, the practical and embodied engagement of people in the production of material culture and the sociocultural shaping of craft behaviors has no impact on the evolutionary trajectory of technologies. What is supposed to be crucial for a technological change is the functional and technical benefits of an innovation. In the rest of my presentation, I will go back to the early history of the potter's wheel that narrates a much more complex and nuanced story of this technological innovation. I will notably focus on the potic practices of early Bronze Age III at the beginning of Middle Bronze Age because during these phases a distinct but invisible technological transition is consolidated that will condition the life trajectory of the potter's wheel until the end of Middle Bronze Age when this tool enters a new era of use. To do this, I will present the result of a microscopic and X-ray analysis of the pottery of four representative archaeological sites. Special emphasis will be placed on the morphostylistic features of wheel-made pots and on the formic techniques and technical gestures involved in their production. The emphasis on the technical gestuality is motivated by a more anthropological understanding of techniques, which emphasizes the social embedded character of material culture. The idea is that formic techniques may express the most stable aspect of craft behaviors because they are linked to the very bodily technical knowledge of a producer. This knowledge is learned and transmitted only through systematic exercise, and it becomes a kind of embodied habitus within a social context of apprenticeship. In this context, the practitioners give meaning to their technological choices and build facets of their identities according to the relations, the habits, and the work use of the communities to which they belong. They are therefore familiarized through an embodied practice with an entire system of values, representations, and reflections on how things can be made. From this point of view, identifying formic techniques and tracking the trajectory over time and space may enable us to trace the meaningful actions of potters. So the first gourmet pots appeared in a sporadic way in the Greek mainland in the middle third millennium during early Bronze Age II, a period of extended connectivity across Eastern Mediterranean and early urbanization in the Aegean. As a recent study has shown, the potters will spread over the Aegean as part of a technological tradition of Western Anatolian origin. The new tool was used in the frame of a hybridized form 
which combine coiling with that valentine rule, a uh, cold rotation and kinetic energy. The new wheel coiling technique was practiced occasionally by small groups of potters who were active in very few settlements in central Greece, like Elfkanti, whereas the majority of sites fully made pots were imported. During this period, the wheel was exclusively associated with the manufacture of new tableware shapes of Western Anatolian style with characteristic red, orange, and dark surfaces. These vessels seem to signal new habits in the consumption of liquids in Central Greece, notably in the context of small scale feasts. It is in the next phase, however, the early Bronze Age III, when we see the wheel being widely disseminated across Eastern Greek mainland, reaching for the first time new regions such as the Northeastern Peloponnese. Until the beginning of Middle Bronze Age, wheel made pots will have been already an indispensable component of pottery production of various settlements. However, the potter's wheel was not widely adopted during these phases. Its frequency is limited in the overall ceramic assemblages, with wheel made pots composing minor or small proportion of the total production. During this period, the potter's wheel participate in contexts of production which are totally different from those of the previous period. The transmission of the wheel from early Bronze Age II to early Bronze Age III coincides actually with dramatic changes occurring in many facets of material culture. The changes seem to entail a profound socio-economic and cultural transformation that will determine the life of communities until the end of Middle Bronze Age. The male societies move uh, now to more introverted strategies of subsistence, which are based on domestic production, regionalism and limited networks of connectivity. One of these alliant changes of this period is the emergence of new drinking pots which replaced the previous long-life tableware vessel. Their appearance and use are considered to convey older cultural practices in consumption which have been performed previously in Central Greece and now adopted widely by small groups of consumers across Greek mainland. The main characteristic of the new vessels is the diversity of their visual appearance which is manifested by means of different stylistic features on surfaces. This variability is interpreted as a sign of the coexistence in settlements of various communities of producers and consumers, as well as an indication of an organization of production that is articulated around household units. Throughout early Bronze Age III and mid Bronze Age, the wheel was systematically linked to the manufacture of a specific grades of these new drinking vessels. It encounters though in vessels which only belong almost exclusively to two distinct categories, the red orange and the grey burnt pottery. The red orange pottery seems to represent older potting practices and is seen as a sign of continuity as of early Bronze Age to cultural habits in consumption. This pottery consists of small assemblages of liquid vessels, whereas it has been a short-life regional pottery tradition, mainly developed in Central Greece and barely survived in Middle Bronze Age. The Grey Bernice pottery in turn is an innovation of the early Bronze Age III and it will become one of the hallmarks of pottery tradition during Middle Bronze Age. This pottery comprises again small assemblages of drinking vessels which are present in many uh, settlements in the, set in the Greek mainland either as locally made products or as imported vessels. Grey pots are interpreted as uh, objects of particular cultural value using small fists. They are actually assumed to express a geomorphic behavior that imitates the visual appearance of silver prototypes. Red orange and grey pottery is made by both hand forming and wheel forming techniques and this is a phenomenon which has been constantly repeated in all the settlements. The potter's wheel is not therefore the exclusive way of making them. On the contrary, both red orange and grey pottery compose visually unique assemblages 
of vessel with a pronounced internal technological variability. So it's now time to get an insight into the manufacturing technology of these wheel-made pods. The macroscopic and radiographic examination demonstrated that as in early process 2, the wheel was everywhere used in combination with calling throughout early bronze age 3 and middle bronze age. The use of the wheel has been inferred by the presence of archive features on surfaces like reeling and striation and by diagonal orientation of voids in the tangential views of pods. Coiling in turn was inferred by fissures on breaks and surfaces and by elongated and shapeless voids along coil seams. However, significant variability has been observed in the specific manners of exploding RKI in Saint Operatoire. Following the four type classification system proposed by Valentin Drew, three different wheel coiling methods were identified, each one implying a different level of expertise. In method 1, RKI entered the operational sequence only at the end of the process to shape the already coiled rough out. The use of the wheel was confirmed only by the presence of horizontal and rectilinear striation surfaces, whereas RKI seems not to affect the clay microstructure, which is characterized by horizontally oriented and flattened voids indicative of coil building without wheel. Method 1 is mainly enacted by a hand-based gestuality, while the RKI gestures are considered of low complexity. In method 2, the coils were formed and joined without RKI. The wheel was only used to thin the walls and shape their fault. The introduction of RKI into these secondary operations resulted in a moderated modification of surfaces, which are characterized by occasional shallow undulations and uneven micro release. Erkai slightly affected the voids of coils which present a horizontal and sometimes diagonal arrangement. Method 2 preserved the hand-based gestuality at a great extent, whereas it required a higher degree of gestural complexity than that of method 1. Finally, the last wheel coiling method identified is method 3. The wheel was here used since the primary forming operation for joining the coils. This led to the radical deformation of all the surfaces and the coil macrostructures. Pots are characterized by pronounced undulation along with reeling striations and stressed walls. Their microstructure presents elongated voids that are strongly diagonal, indicative of continuous pressures on the clay while building the rough out. The degree of coil deformation was so intense that the coil joints sometimes appear in the form of elongated fissures with strongly diagonal alignment. Method 3 reformed radically the typical gestural sequence of coiling and required the acquisition of highly specialized wheel-based gestures. As you can see in the graph, the three methods are distributed unevenly among the settlement. For example, at Lefkandi in Central Greece, we observe the marginal uses of method 2, while the highly demanding method 3, which was the typical method of the wheel-made poetry during the previous period, remains predominant. Elsewhere in Central Greece, at Tevkakia, we encounter, on the contrary, the exclusive and constant use of method 2, which implies a unique way of practicing the tool at the site. Conversely, at Lerna, in northeastern Peloponnese, there is a striking variability in wheel coiling methods, with method 3 prevalent and method 2 and method 1 more peripheral. Finally, in the neighboring site of Tirins, both uh, method 2 and method 3 were identified with the later dominating of the production. The coexistence of different wheel coiling methods within ceramic assemblages implicates the lack of standardized craft behaviors among settlements. If we admit that each method implies a set of learned skills specific to distinct production units, we could assume that this variability suggests potters with a different degree of expertise. 
while the highly specialized method 3 appeared as the more frequent will-based potting practice which is shared among uh, settlements, the observed technological pluralism testifies to the existence of potters who, despite their training in the same will-based tradition, develop different skills and habits. This could mean that each community is characterized by a diverse, diversified pattern in the manners of learning and transmitting the will over time. So, what all this data could mean for the early biography of the potter's will in prehistoric Aegean? First, we could say that the potting communities of early and mid Bronze Age tell us a different story from the one expected. Instead of being widely adopted due to the assumed techno-economic advantages against hand performing, the potters will remain for centuries a craft practice of low visibility restricted within the borders of specific communities of potters. Long before its general uptake, the will has been a resistant and deeply rooted technological tradition in societies with any evident sign of centralized and hierarchical structures of power. Contrary to the dominant narrative, which wants a nucleated socio-economic organization to afford the innovation of the will, this technology appears in societies which are rather grounded on the segmentation of production into small groups of potters. What we recognize then to the use of the will is the actions of small communities of potters who share a unique, rare and sophisticated craft knowledge totally different from the dominant hand-based potting technologies. Therefore, the will seems to designate a kind of boundary among potters possessing the knowledge of the tool and potters who persist in hand forming. Tracing the technical action of these communities, we can also get an insight into the modalities of their constitution and reproduction over time and space. On the one hand, these communities are trained in a long-lived and old technological tradition which is based on the will-calling technique. They seem, however, to ensure the transmission of this tradition by following their own models of apprenticeship. If we admit that the passage from one method to the other corresponds to an escalated mastery of the will, then the coexistence of different methods with a different degrees of, gestures, of gestural complexity will be seen as indicative of local modalities of learning and possibly of individual ways of practicing the will. On the other hand, the potters who use the will are exclusively engaged in the production of a very specific kind of pottery which has apparently a particular function in the social life of certain group of groups of consumers. This strong link between wheel technology and particular ceramic objects, which has been remained unchanged for centuries, comes to unify the space of production and consumption and to accord a discrete role to the practitioners of the wheel. To grasp this role, we, could take, we shall take into consideration that the potter's wheel was not only the only technology involved in the manufacture of these ceramic objects. As we saw, the same kind of pottery was produced by both wheel coiling and hand forming techniques and held by potters who were trained in different technological traditions. The participation of potters with different potting habits in the production of the same objects could be seen as an indication that the forming technology of these objects was possibly indifferent for the consumers who, as the pronounced stylistic diversity of pottery uh, suggests, give probably more meaning to their visual appearance. Given that the manufacturing process is usually an inaccessible and invisible information for the consumer of pottery, we could assume that the use of the wheel may mean something only for the practitioners and that the kind of cultural value was perpetuated through the practice of the tool itself. If this is true, we could think that these potters shape a facet of their social or cultural identity upon a specific bodily knowledge and a unique conception of making pots that goes beyond hand-forming. 
From this perspective, the potter's wheel seems to have been used for centuries as a cultural practice, as a traditional efficient act that presumably posed cultural and possibly conceptual constraints to the wider adoption of this technological innovation. The release uh, from these barriers seemed to take place after many centuries when the communities of the central uh, uh, um, of the Greek mainland entered a new era of social organization and a definition of their identities. But it is, of course, uh, the subject of another project and an another presentation. Thank you very much.